But the main objective of this session is to bring together key partners for the platform and to discuss how to promote integrated fire management at scale, including for sustainable food systems. So I'm Henry Bonds, who is a television and radio broadcaster from the UK and Ghana. I've been asked by the FAO forestry team to work with them for this session. And I also met a number of you in Korea during the World Forestry Congress. So I'm going to invite a number of people onto the stage. Amy Duchel, Senior Forestry Officer, Team Leader, Forestry and Climate Change. Amy, you go there. Peter Moore, who's a consultant, a fire management specialist with FAO. Lara Steil, who is a forestry officer in the forest fire management team at FAO. Francesco Gaetani will be joining us online, and Francesco is a science policy regional coordinator for the United Nations Environment Programme. So that's uh, going to be Francesco. And we have Jesus San Miguel, senior researcher at the Joint Research Centre of the European Commission. Jesus, thank you very much indeed. You're all welcome. All right, so we need to set the scene. I've already mentioned the intensity, the ferocity and the duration of these fire seasons occurring in a whole variety of habitats. But fire does have two faces. So I'd like you to focus your eyes on the big screen behind me as we run this video. I've got coordinates and uh, size for spot number two. Thank you. That was a good video. That was very, it's very, very brief, but to the point. Okay, so in a moment, we're going to hear from Peter Moore, who will present the Global Fire Management Platform proposal. But first, for some opening remarks, and um, Amy, you may want to respond to what we saw in that video. I'm going to give the floor to Amy Duchel, Senior Forestry Officer, Team Leader in the Forestry and Climate Change Division. Amy, over to you. Uh, thank you, Henry, and thank you all for being here, including many who are online watching this event today. And in fact, I'm here on behalf of Tina Vahanen, the Deputy Director of the FAO Forestry Division, who was called by the Chair of COFO for Emergency Business. So this is, this is what happens during COFO, but I'm, I'm happy to be here. And really a pleasure to be here from, with partners from several countries who we'll hear from, including the Republic of Korea, Turkey, Indonesia, Indonesia Argentina, Ghana, Brazil and, and global partners from the Green Climate Fund, UN Environment Program, and the Joint Research Center of the EU. So we'll have this panel and then another panel um, to, to, to hear about that. And I mean, I think it's very clear wildfires are, are everywhere and in the news and those who weren't even paying attention um, to climate change. Um, now, now they are. Now, now they are, yes. right? Okay. So I think we have an important opportunity, in fact, to 
to um, address the climate crisis, including through integrated fire management. And FAO has been a proponent of integrated fire management for a long time, and I'm sitting here with one of the experts on this, um, who you'll hear from in a moment. Um, and, and we're also now launching this, this new initiative with UNEP, which we're very excited about, and other partners on the global fire management platform, uh, which we will also hear about today. And, you know, one important aspect that we do want to highlight in, in the global fire management platform is the focus on indigenous and traditional knowledge yeah. and as a key component to a holistic approach to fire management. And we're very lucky to now have Lada Style with us at FAO, who's worked on this a long time in Brazil and the Amazon region more broadly. Um, so we will hear today about, uh, you know, innovations in integrated fire management already in place. We will hear about this proposal for the global fire management platform, which is underway and actually needs all of your help to, to make it something that we can all um, work on together and, and um, learn about how the platform can support the efforts that are already ongoing. Because of course, you know, integrated fire management, this is really a, a topic globally, nationally, that, that many people are already working on and we, we can join efforts to do something um, together to, to manage fires for climate and people. So, thank you. Amy, thank you very much for those opening remarks. You've set the scene uh, perfectly. Well, uh, we both defer to Peter's knowledge in, in this particular area because he has been really working hard on this global fire management platform proposal. You said, Amy, there's a lot of knowledge out there already, indigenous knowledge, traditional knowledge, and it's important, as you said, to understand it's not about wiping out fires altogether. I think it said in the video, they're an essential part of the ecosystem, the naturally occurring fires. For a layman like me, for a person who just watches the news or presents the news and thinks, oh my God, there's a fire, we have to put it out. What is the difference between the two? How do you know when the fire is good and when the fire is bad? Peter, it's over to you. I mean, I'm a, lay I'm a layman. So please tell us about this global fire management platform proposal. Give him a round of applause, because he's going to tell us that this is something we're very excited about. So let's tell us, yeah. Thank you very much, Henry. I'm very excited about it. Have been for many years, Good. For four decades. <laughs> um, so if we can have the presentation up, please. Um, you just saw in, in UNEP's, uh, in that short video, a lot of the things, the reasons that we're going through. So UNEP and FAO are collaborating with others, and we have some up here on the stage, and some of you down there, and, and we're talking to many different organisations and people to develop a fire platform. You have to point it out there. Oh, oh, yeah. There we go. Just some, some background and some context. Obviously fires have been with us for thousands of years as humans, tens of thousands of years, and, and the issue that we are facing today has been with us for many decades. FAO in that time has supported countries in fire management uh, through that time, providing analysis and guidance. Um, today, uh, on the COFO 26 agenda, there are two items on forest fires and there's this side event. So it's something that has a lot of importance and that is being increasingly recognised. The Global Fire Management Platform was announced at the World Forestry Congress. Henry mentioned the Congress uh, in Korea. Uh, and two directors of FAO and UNEP uh, announced that there'd be this collaboration. We're collaborating to bring together the global experience we have in space and in time. FAO has many, many country offices, over 130, uh, and lots of global networks that can be tapped into. If you're going to get a group of people together and a group of agencies to work on something, why focus on wildfires? Well, we just saw in the video some of the downsides, some of the bad fire, uh, the two faces of fire. It's an increasing risk that it poses to people in the environment. And we should note that eliminating the risk of wildfires is not possible. Uh, there are many of us in this room that have spent decades of effort, and we know that is completely true. Um, and that's because firefighting has very clear limitations. There are quite strong limits to what humans can do and what technology can do in terms of suppressing fires. So the answer to that is integrated fire management. Uh, that's to bring together social and environmental dimensions. Social is critically important because people light 90% of the fires. 
Uh, it's not arson, that's accident, misadventure, need for use for the livelihoods. Uh, and therefore we need to work with them and they also suffer most of the damage and loss. So we need to look at those dimensions of social, or society and people, culture, at the environment, and then in particular, as, as Amy mentioned in her remarks, traditional and, and indigenous land management. Humans have been on landscapes for tens of thousands of years. We have worked out many, many different ways of managing and working and living with those landscapes. So that's key. Another reason for working on them is because wildfires are very widespread. So the darker the red in this, in this uh, history of 20 years of wildfires, is then the more fires there are. You can see that Africa, parts of Southeast Asia, um, Northern Australia, parts of South America um, are very, have very high incidences, but virtually throughout the world there are um, fires. This slide's a bit different because it shows that compared to the long term, what's happened in the last, in the five years from 2014 to 2019. If the colour is blue, then the number of fires has reduced. If the colour is red, then the number of fires has increased. So you can see that the world in, in different places, different things are happening. So it's a global issue, it's, got, it's changing, uh, and we need to work with it. Why have a platform? Um, fires are increasing and they're increasingly impacting. So we need to strengthen fire management through integrated fire management. And one of the reasons for that is that, in my experience, in different countries in the world, the solutions to every problem in fire management already exist. The methods, the tools, the thinking, the approach to data, the analysis, it already exists. The tragedy is it doesn't exist in one place. And so there isn't a country that's really got the whole picture together. And so we need to take that capacity and leadership and demonstrate a way of bringing people together with their part of the solution, their piece of the jigsaw, to work with others. And the best way to do that is to have a platform where we can exchange. And doing that, we'll leverage the existing UNEP and FAO partnership, aligned with the UN Decade on Ecosystem Restoration, but other partnerships, as with the Joint Research Centre of the European Union, with the Global Fire Monitoring Centre, and other international initiatives that already exist, but aren't well connected. We have a platform, there's some good ideas, it's a good point in history to have it. What will we do with it? Um, a knowledge hub is obviously a key thing. It's a key and interesting thing. We talk about integrated fire management. People who do social sciences, environmental sciences, cultural and anthropological sciences don't often talk to each other. And so we need to bring those together and a hub is a way of helping to do that. We'll provide accessible technical advice and information. As I mentioned, there's a lot of it, but it's not available consistently and will stimulate collaboration and contribution from those partners. Um, the idea is to be a sharing, a place of sharing. Fire risk assessment and early warning is another, another element. Many countries don't have a system and while fire risk assessment, while it's emerging, it's not yet a fully formed discipline. Uh, and so we'll be working with that to communicate those methods and tools in other places and across the world. A lot of the things that I've just talked about are technical, about meteorological information, fire information, data, etc. And we're very good at those things. What we're not as good at is the softer things, the policy support. How do we make sure that agencies within a country are working together? How do we make sure that the community is engaged through the next level of the jurisdiction to the national level? How do those communications, how does that governance get framed and formed? And so there'll be a, quite a focus on integrating integrated fire management, international and subnational policies. And of course, the platform will look at future modes, future modules and things as needed. One of the things we'll be doing is linking existing fire efforts. Um, I'm sure amongst all of you down there, and certainly up here, we know that FA and UNEP have some joint initiatives. There's the Forest Resources Assessment, the FRA, that many of you will know about, that will, from next year on, be including a, an update on fires and, and their management fire, fire incidents. We have the UN Decade on Restoration, 
a massive global effort that's um, also something that has to be looking and is looking at fire and its management. And of course, the UN Red that so many of us are involved with or touch upon that is also looking at results-based payments in relation to climate change, greenhouse gas mitigation. There are many technical developments. We mentioned one here, which is a fire monitoring module that's being developed in FAO under the CEPA uh, module um, platform. And there are many, many others uh, that are happening. We have a lot of partners. I mentioned the Joint Research Centre and the Global Wildfire Information System. So the platform will not reinvent any wheels. It'll just make links and connections to the people that are already doing good things and help them to communicate and bring them together with others that need their skill set. Included in that, I mentioned earlier, the Global Fire Monitoring Centre, which is an enormous repository of past activities and history, which is an incredibly valuable resource that we need to look at. Thank you very much for listening. I look forward to discussion that we're having today and hope you're all completely interested in fire management and that you stay that way. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very much. Peter, Peter, stay there for a second. Yes, clap. <laughs> because it says any questions there, is there a, a very immediate question, an immediate response to what Peter has just presented? While it's top of your mind right now, speak now or forever hold your peace. Just very quickly, Peter, how urgent is this particular innovation? How urgent is the need? I, I personally think it's really, really urgent. And the main reason for that is that, that there are pieces of information, ideas and methods and tools that get made and then get lost. So if we don't start quickly, some of those will be lost. The second thing is that what we're talking about in integrated fire management, it takes a long time. This is not a quick fix. It's not a silver bullet. You need to be working with communities and cultures, governments and agencies and so on. And building that rapport, that relationship is a long-term effort. So the sooner we start, the sooner we make progress, the sooner we build more momentum. Peter, thank you very much indeed. Please take your seat. Now, um, you talked about not reinventing the wheel, but about linking current fire efforts, because there's an awful lot of very good work going on, and that's great. Uh, but you talked about those uh, key organisations, FAO, of course, we're here in FAO, UNEP, and the Joint Research Centre of the European Commission. We need to hear from each organisation exactly how they're going to contribute to this platform and make sure it works. It's all very well developing a new platform, but then it can wither on the vine if people aren't using it properly and feeding into it properly. So let's hear from our uh, colleagues from those three agencies. First of all, Laura Steil is here, Forestry Officer in the Department of Forest Fire Management. So Laura, you can explain how exactly you and your colleagues are going to feed into this. Uh, thank you so much, Henry. Uh, yes, uh, the efforts of uh, FAO uh, to build uh, this uh, global platform will be focused on, as Peter said, connecting the initiatives, the lessons learned, and the expertise already in place around the globe. Integrated fire management is an approach where the dialogue of knowledge uh, is a key point for its success. And it's important to connect the knowledge and experience from science practitioners, managers, communities, and as already mentioned, indigenous and traditional peoples. We have uh, already made many important efforts in this uh, direction. FAO has a long history in fire management. FAO's first publication, the top key, is from 1953. Wow. Long time ago. Okay. And uh, also, FAO promoted the, the development of fire networks that are active and uh, hold deep experti expertise on, on fire management. And taking advantage of this technical know how uh, of FAO and associating it to the know how of other important initiatives like the Global Fire Monitoring Center. Uh, that is coordinated by, by a well-known fire person, Johan Goldamer, uh, who has uh, more than 30 years of uh, history and expertise and experience uh, on fire management. And also the Global Fire Monitoring Center uh, is linked, linked to 14 regional wildland fire networks. So connecting these initiatives 
uh, and inspiring actions, we intend to promote the cross-boundary uh, fire, integrated fire management uh, and strengthen local, regional and national capacities. It's important to mention that the development of the platform is an open tent for the collaboration of uh, other institutions, uh, so everyone is welcome. FAO, FAO will also bring to the platform the FAO methodology for integrated fire management that we call the five R's, uh, review and analysis to understand uh, why uh, fire is happening and how it's happening in the territory, uh, risk reduction, we have to focus on prevention, Readiness, we are not going to stop all fires in the whole world, so we have to be ready to respond. The fourth uh, R is response, and the last one is recovery. It's also our interest to have an expert database at the platform, so the countries, regions, and the stakeholders who need advice and uh, technical support on a specific aspect of integrated fire management uh, will find a specialist in the platform. Also, we will focus our efforts on the innovations for a global platform. We will highlight the importance of the human diversity, gender equ equity and inclusion, empowering uh, indigenous and traditional uh, knowledge. Important initiatives uh, in Latin America, for example, are being carried out related to uh, indigenous knowledge. And uh, the experience there shows that the participatory and the intercultural approach allow improvements on minimizing the damaging fires. And uh, looking to those local solutions, including them, in a global platform where countries, institutions, and uh, stakeholders can learn from them, it will uh, be possible to generate global uh, positive outcomes. So the idea is local solutions for uh, positive global outcomes. Thank you so much, and over to you, Thank Henry. you, Lara. I was trying, you may not have seen, I was trying to direct Lara's uh, eyes towards my stopwatch. Four minutes, that's exactly what you did. Thank you very much indeed. It's one of these techniques that you have, you go like this and you go. Well, <laughs> no, but that was wonderful. Thank you very much for that. A lot of technical know-how and expertise, which we're going to draw on. And um, one particular word, well, it's two words, kind of leapt out at me, cross boundaries. So you're gonna be working across these boundaries as you must because the fire knows no boundaries either. You see what I'm doing there? Very good. Exactly Excellent. Like well, no, but it's true because sometimes these metaphors are worthy of being used. And if a fire knows no boundaries, how can you know boundaries? You shouldn't. Excellent. So let's move on now to UNEP. And we have Science Policy Regional Coordinator Francesco Gaetani. And Francesco is online and he's going to give us his remarks to explain how UNEP is going to feed in and to coordinate in a transboundary way into this platform. Over to you, Francesco. Francesco. Yes, thank you indeed. Uh, good morning, everybody from Panama City. And let me start my very uh, short remarks with uh, an expression of gratitude to be in this uh, session and to participate in this session together with uh, FAO, and also to express our satisfaction to continue this work with FAO to find concrete and viable solutions to reduce the risk of fires and to um, reduce the impact on fires on, on society and ecosystems. The, um, today's event um, follows a quite successful uh, uh, discussion held in May this year at the World Forest Congress, where a, a fire management um, uh, platform was presented uh, together by UNEP and FAO. And also, as mentioned before, uh, uh, the publication of a quite interesting and important uh, uh, report, Spreading Like Wildfire, which received an overwhelming response 
in terms of downloads and interest from very different readers all over the world. And this actually is very much clear to us and it is very much clear that we need to work together for a new NAP to find a solution, to work with communities, to work with countries and to provide them the capacity and the tools that they need to reduce the impacts uh, of, of, of wildfires on their uh, lives and uh, on the ecosystem where they live. From uh, an observational perspective, speaking from Latin America in my case, and starting from the assumption that the vast majority of wildfires are caused by human activities, including the land use, land cover change, including deforestation, of course, afforestation, but also uh, important global stressors like climate change and other, other stressors that are uh, related to the, to the conditions of climate. We uh, should also um, consider the fact that uh, there is a, an evidence of a clear increase in the frequency and the magnitude of, of these uh, extreme weather conditions, or notably uh, water extremes. And these conditions are, um, in most of the cases, the reason why the cause, why the vegetation that in general would not usually burn uh, is becoming a suitable fuel mm. for the ignition of massive, large, and very, uh, in very, very uh, dangerous uh, wildfires. So climate change, climate variability, land use, land cover change, and uh, all these factors are a very, very uh, strong reason for us to start working on this and to see how we can work, especially on the prevention phase and uh, on the reduction of the risk and exposure to wildfires. Um, in Latin America in particular, wildfires are becoming a, a really uh, a real important threat for ecosystems. Last year, uh, we had a massive wildfire that burned one third of one of the most important uh, uh, natural wetlands in, uh, in the world, which is the Pantanal. And this is a clear uh, sign that uh, uh, wildfires cannot be uh, um, considered as, a, as a, an event that is part of the ecosystem because uh, um, there are uh, conditions, especially climate conditions that are actually changing the normal uh, 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 fire regimes in uh, ecosystems like wetlands that uh, usually were not affected by wildfires. And um, in this context, achieving and sustaining adaptive land fire uh, management, land and fire management uh, requires uh, a well-designed combination of policies, a very clear legal framework, and incentives that encourage appropriate land and fire use. And in particular, as mentioned by my colleagues before, is very critical to uh, engage with communities, including indigenous groups, local authorities and uh, especially in wildfire prone areas to understand and accept the residual risk of wildfire and to strengthen coordination of key stakeholders that are part of the uh, prevention and response mechanism in place now, to reduce uh, now, the risk. Francesco, of Francesco I'm, taking I'm taking advantage of the pause to invite you, as they say in Ghana, to land. Landing means drawing your comments very rapidly to a close because you're over your time. Have you made your substantive points? We'll add other, another two points, which are, first of all, uh, we need to work in the prevention phase and to work with meteorological uh, uh, and hydrological services to enhance early warning service and early warning systems capacity. And also, we need to work uh, in the red, uh, in the red context, uh, to enhance our capaci capacity to assess the risk of wildfires, to protect the buffer that are part of the red program. And this concludes my remarks. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Francesco Gaetani. Thank you very much indeed. Excellent. Oh yes. Okay. You see, Francesco.
You've got a round of applause here in the room, here in the red room. And it's not easy to get a round of applause in the red room. Excellent. Okay, so we're now going to uh, move over to my colleague, our colleague on my far left. So Jesus San Miguel, who is a senior researcher at the JRC, which is part of the European Commission, to explain how you're going to feed into this and hopefully help coordinate and build on the knowledge that is already out there. Yeah, well, thank you very much. Uh, first, uh, I would like to thank uh, FAO for inviting me to this panel. I'm really honored to be here and see how we could contribute uh, to the Global Fire Platform. A little bit of my institution. I come from the Joint Research Center, which is a technical body of the European Commission. And our role is specifically to provide data to uh, enhance evidence-based policies in the European Union. The idea in, with regard to the Global Fire Platform is similar. The idea is to provide evidence that can support policies and uh, further, implement, uh, further implementation of uh, integrated fire management. I will focus on four points that I think are the main points in which we can contribute. Uh, something that uh, Peter mentioned is that something that is very important is wildfire risk assessment. Wildfire risk assessment requires data, requires information on past trends, uh, current trends, evolution of number of fires, evolution of the fire season, impact of the fires in the last 10, 20 years. So in GWIS, with the help of FAO, we have implemented something that is called country profiles that provides this type of information trends at a country and sub-country level for all the countries around the world that can serve as a basis to develop wildfire risk assessment, clearly with the limitations of global data. But, and the collaboration with FAO is not new. So we've been collaborating with FAO many years in Europe. And that brings me to my second point. The second point is that uh, we are developing uh, platforms, networks to support policy making and share data among countries, share not only data, but good practices. You mentioned that countries don't stop in the borders, and that is precisely why harmonized or standardized information is needed. Countries, many countries have information systems, and they are very valid, and the problem with the information systems in each country is that they are country-tailored. So the information from one country is often not comparable to the information from another country. That is why regional or global information systems, such as uh, when Peter did the, pres the presentation, he mentioned the global welfare information system, can uh, help sharing, harmonize or standardize information among countries. Furthermore, with FAO, we collaborated in Europe, establishing what is called the expert group on forest fires, which brings together all the European countries plus countries in North Africa and Middle East. So this collaboration has been really a success and is still ongoing. And that started over 20 years ago. The idea in the Global Fire Platform is to do something similar, to provide the networks or platforms that can serve to discuss about integrated fire management and policy making at regional or global level. We have recently established with FAO and UNEP what is called the Expert Group on Forest Fires in Latin America and Caribbean. And we are meeting with the national fire managers twice every year. We had the first uh, physical meeting because of the pandemic. It was the first one in Santiago at the end of July. And we will meet in Brasilia in November. FAO has participated from the beginning. And of course, we expect and hope that they will continue collaborating the same as UNEP or in the case of the Amazon, the Amazon Cooperation Treaty Organization. So that could be the second point in networking and establishing platform. The third point is on uh, doing fire monitoring. Uh, fire managers not only need to do wildfire risk, risk assessment, they need to monitor what is ongoing in the country. So in, in the global wildfire uh, wild, uh, information system, we have established a platform that is updated continuously, daily, for uh, all the countries around the world in which we provide ongoing statistics of number of fires, burnt area, impact of those fires, uh, emissions, etc. And that can serve many countries that do not have a system and can serve as a reference for those countries that have information systems. And that, is, that would be my third point. 
And finally, my fourth point is not so technical, it's on, but it's also interesting, I think, because the, the programs under which we are working are very stable programs of the European Union. So we are working under two main programs. One is called Tay, Tay Amazon, Team Europe Initiative on the Amazon, that is focused on Latin America and the Caribbean. And another one is called Copernicus, so the space program of the European Union. And all these platforms that we are developing with UNEP, FAO, ACTO, are under these two programs, which provide stable funding and continuity, which is really needed. Because Peter mentioned that the, the problem with fire information is that until now it has been scattered in systems that were there for some time, but then they were dropped. So with the Global Wildfire Information System, I think we can uh, uh, guarantee that we will provide a platform of data and information that can serve and support the Global Fire Platform. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Really good. Thank you very much indeed. That's really, really good. Thank you very much, Jesus. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm really interested in this, um, uh, this country profiles that you're, you're doing and risk assessments so that countries can be aware of where they are in uh, all the indicators that might put them at risk and act accordingly. Um, we've got a couple of minutes wriggle room, I think. And if we want to take advantage of that now with, with a question, I've got a question, certainly I want to ask, but if, um, ah, yes, gentlemen then, please uh, put your microphone on and tell us who you are and make your question uh, brief, please. Uh, could you move to the seat next to you, maybe? And if that one was working as well? Are they not on? Sorry, Marco. Yeah, I know this wasn't part of the program, but the Red Room gives you special fiery energy. To coin a phrase. So, thank you, sir. Thomas Hausmann, head of the Liaison Unit of Forest Europe, which is a ministerial process of 45 European countries to pro promote sustainable forest management. I was very happy to listen in all the panelists that prevention and preparedness is a key. Um, this is exactly also the way we are working. However, our experience with policy makers, with ministers, decision makers is that they are not so much interested in this phase. They are maybe showing up once a fire needs to be fighted, if a, f a forest fire a plane has been bought. And my question to the expert is, could you give us concrete advice how to shift the interest of policymakers, of ministers, more to the prevention and preparedness phase? Thank you. Thank you, Thomas. Prevention is always better than cure. And that's a, a, a saying in almost every language in the world. Who wants to take that um, question? Amy, Peter? Yeah, okay. There we go. Thank you, Marco. Um, thank you very much. That's an extremely valid point, And it's, it's uh, an experience that I've had many, many times over the years. Um, and it, it seems with social media and things, it only gets to be deeper and more, and more separated because of the instantaneous nature of things. So suppression, firefighting is what we see all the time. I mentioned that one of the reasons for, st for starting the platform quickly was to, that this would take time. And unfortunately, really good integrated fire management, it's incredibly difficult to take a good photograph of something like that. Um, it's, it's not terribly exciting. I mean, it's exciting to me and it's exciting to communities that are involved in it and governments and agencies that are involved, but it's not politically or socially exciting necessarily. So I, I think the advice is one of the big gaps in the points in the things we're discussing is that we don't have an effective, consistent assessment of the damage and loss. You'll see insurance company estimates, but that's only for those that are insured. You'll see other people's estimates, but they're very uh, rough. There's not a consistent methodology. You won't see human health factored in very often or very well. And you won't see dislocation and the trauma of the events that affect people. So once those costs are added up and the damage and loss is assessed, then the idea of preventing or reducing that by 10%, 15%, 20%, whatever, is, is a very strong argument that can be held. So we need to pick up on Jesus's point, we need more data. So we need the risk assessment, but we need the data that helps us to make that point. Yeah. Uh, at the moment, the suppression expenditure is about 10 times 
the or the losses and damage are about ten times what we spend in total right. on suppression. So, so if you so speak to the politicians seven. and the policymakers in a language they can understand, and that the voters, the taxpayers, will understand, maybe you will cut through. I'm just going to try and squeeze in one more, if we have one. Marco, I know you're ready to take the microphone to anybody else, if we have one. If not, then we'll move on. But, uh, ah, yes, sir, there, right in the middle. And be as brief as you can, and we'll try and respond briefly. Yes, my, my name is Hervé Levit. I'm uh, working at FAO. Uh, my question is uh, about the platform itself. Are you going to, to look at also at uh, solutions when the, the fires have happened, you know? What, what are the advice to give to, to the people and to the local people and probably the governments also in terms of uh, what next? How you can val valorize the, the wood itself? It's a big issue. And also what to do after? Do we keep forest? Or do we change completely? That's a big debate in France, for example, mm. where we had these big fires in the West before there was humid uh, zones. Do we keep the, the forest as, as it okay. is or, or not? Yeah. So that's my question about the, the role of the platform. Thank you very much. Peter. Um, it's interesting because we had a discussion this morning with our Indonesian colleagues, uh, with Lara and Amy and I, and one of the things that we looked at for the platform was about techniques. In this case, we were talking specifically about fighting fires in tropical forests. There isn't really a body of knowledge about that. So that's one of the things that would happen which would address that. In, in terms of restoration, um, the UN decade on ecosystem restoration is, is obviously the place where those techniques, those methods, history, etc., can, can be brought to bear. And, and I sympathise greatly with France with the, with the decision frame that it now has of what to do with, I think it's now three times 8,000 hectares or something yeah. in the past two years. Thank you very much. Put your hands together for the panel. Peter, Amy, Lara, Jesus and Francesco. Thank you. That was a really good, great session. We're now going to change panellists. So I'll invite you to leave your seats and uh, move off the stage. Thank you very much indeed. Because we now have a second panel. We're moving into another phase of our discussion. We're now going to move to the countries. We heard about the experience of France just a moment ago. Uh, countries' advances where they are and also their needs when it comes to integrating fire management. So I'm going to invite uh, Ms. Gina Kim, who will be online. She's the director of the International Cooperation Division at the Korea Forest Service. Mr. Ur Karakoch, who is here, a forest engineer. He's part of the General Directorate of Forestry at the Ministry of Agriculture and Forestry, Turkey. And then we have Dr. Rafles B. Panyantan, who is an expert staff of the Minister, the Landscape Fire Ministry of the Environment and Forestry from Indonesia. Mr. Martin Monaco, Director of Forests, the Ministry of Environment and Sustainable Development from Argentina. So Mr. Martin Monaco, I think he's here, yes. Thank you very much, sir. And online will be Ms. Lucy Amisa, research scientist, Forestry Research Institute of Ghana. I can see you, Lucy Amisa, there. Very good day to you. And also, I can see Ms. Gina Kim. Thank you very much for being there. And also, last but not least, Mr. Carlos Lopez, Maxakali Indigenous Leader and President of the National Confederation of Family Farmers and Rural Family Entrepreneurs. So thank you very much indeed for joining us. Okay, so there are two questions which I'm going to put to you and you can answer in one go. I'm going to start off with uh, Madam Gina Kim uh, from the Republic of Korea. Uh, what relevant innovation in integrated fire management is happening in Korea? I, I think I heard a bit about this when we had the World Forestry Congress in Seoul. So what relevant innovation and also how you see this global fire management platform that Peter has just launched supporting your work? Thank you, Mr. Henny. 
Uh, good afternoon, I'm Tina Kim. I would like to begin my presentation by thanking the FA colleagues for inviting me to this meaningful event to share the Republic of Korea's practices on integrated forest fire management. The Korea Forest Service has its own team dedicated to forest fire prevention and control. Moreover, as a KFS affiliated organization, the National in Institute of Forest uh, Science conduct forest fire related research. Yes, forest fire used to occur frequently in Korea during a uh, dry spring season, April to May, but recently forest fire in uh, Korea happened all year round, except for rainy season, July to August. It is because the dry condition continues uh, due to extreme weather caused by climate change. Also, the scale is growing uh, along with increased frequency. In March this year, Korea saw the largest forest fire in its history, which resulted in huge damages to property. The KFS thinks that integrated approach is required for forest fire management. So the forest agency has the comprehensive measures to forest fire and the measures include plans for forest fire prevention, preparedness and suppression. Uh, in this regard, I would like to briefly explain the Korea's measure. First is uh, forest thinning to reduce the density of the forest for fire prevention and planting of trees to create the forest more resistant to fire. Moreover, we expand the forest roads that serve as fire break as the uh, forest fire prevention stage. Second, we provide real time uh, of fire danger by administrative district, districts while comprehensively re referring to weather, fire danger index, and other factors. For accurate forecasting, the KFS established the mountain weather station nationwide to collect and analyze meteorological information in forests. Uh, the ROK has an official period of high fire danger designated according to the uh, uh, fire forecast. During that period, there is restriction of access to mountains and use of uh, flammable items such as cigarette and lighter. Third, regarding the forest fire suppression, the KFS has affiliated agency, the uh, Forest Aviation Headquarters. The headquarters confront forest fire with the fire suppression helicopter. It has 117 helicopters with 2,000 to 8,000 uh, liters of water capacity. Fourth, Korea scientifically analyzed the boundary and the damages of forest fire hit area with the video footage of satellite and drones in order to restore the reason, then conduct one on site inspects based on the analysis. And we established practical plans for forest restoration through active communication with export to local community, forester, and civil group and carry out the restoration activity properly. Finally, Korea promotes innovative responses to forest fire, utilizing cutting edge uh, scientific technology. The Korea Forest Service operates a system that identifies the situation of the forest fires nationwide in real time. We are able to precise monitor the on-site situation through the GPS-based fire watch system for reporting fires and identifying the outbreak location. Uh, that is all I would like to introduce the uh, Korea's integrated fire management system. And regarding the second question, the global fire management platform, uh, first of all, I would like to congratulate on establishment of the foundation of the global fire fire management platform developed by FAO and UNEP. I believe this platform will become a significant opportunity to enhance the management capacity of member states by sharing knowledge and information related to fire management with each other. In, res in this respect, I would like to thank FAO and UNEP for providing such great opportunity. It is my thought that wildfire would require different strategies for 
the prevention and suppression depending on geographically and meteorological condition and on site the situation. The Korea Forest Service has great interest in global cooperation on forest fire, so it's pushing ahead with the project on restoration of fire hit area and fire prevention with Mongolia. I think that if member states share fire-related information together through the global fire management platform, it will become a great help for implementing bilateral and multilateral projects on, for, on forest fire. I look forward to the platform to help members to improve their fire danger management and increase invest, investment in reducing the fire danger. Uh, as you may know, the Republic of Korea officially launched the Assuring the Future of Forest with Integrated Risk Management Mechanism with FAO on the occasion of the Fire Management Forum held at the 15th World Forestry Congress. It is my hope that the Open Mechanism and the Global Fire Mechanism Platform a Management Platform will contribute to enhance fire uh, responses of FAO's member countries. Thank you. Thank you for your attention. Much indeed, indeed. Miss Kim, for giving, us, Kim that for giving us that very detailed, very detailed perspective. perspective. <laughs> From the Republic of Korea. Marco, you did warn me. He did warn me. This is a technical guru and his team. And they said to me, Henry, because of the delay, give them a chance when they're online. And I didn't because I'm so hot and energized. I'm so keen. So, Marco, sorry about that, okay? Fantastic. Uh, before we move on to the Republic of Turkey, I would like to invite Mr. Petri Voranan, a Senior Forest and Land Use Specialist from the Green Climate Fund, to join us on stage, because when we have heard from all our panelists, we'll then want to hear from you via the GCF. Thank you very much indeed for that, for joining us now. So let's find out what's happening in uh, Turkey, and I'm delighted to invite Mr. Ur Karakoci, who's with the General Directorate of Forestry at the Ministry of Agriculture and Forestry, to respond to that question. So the relevant innovation in integrated fire management, what's happening in your region, and also how you see this platform supporting your work. Over to you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Yes. Give the floor to me. First of all, after maybe one year ago, our, we changed our name of the country, Turkey. Yes, Turkey. Yes, not, not Turkey anymore. Yes, Turkey. So, thank you so much. Now I would like to start uh, giving a short information about uh, uh, what's going on in Turkey, about the forestry. So uh, different from the other countries, 99% uh, of the forests are uh, governed and owned by state. So uh, for forest fires, we have own uh, fire management department and we are uh, combating the fires with our own uh, department. So we have uh, own uh, vehicles, own personnel and uh, also we have a grant vehicles and air vehicles as well to com uh, combating the white fires. So it gives us a uh, an advantage uh, because uh, if you utilize from the forest engineers, uh, they will aware of the uh, forest uh, structures and their forest engineers as well, masters on this issue, and they can uh, know how to uh, combat well and then effectively. So I would like to uh, give an information about the forest fires in Turkey. Uh, like the 60% of Turkey is a really sensitive uh, areas for forest fires. So, uh, like as the other countries, uh, which are uh, really sensitive uh, countries, we should uh, improve ourselves and we need to keep up with new technologies for combating forest fires. And we need to know uh, that it's not only our uh, issue, it's already a global problem. And we are already aware of that we, are, uh, we have this responsibility as a Turkey. So uh, I would like to give some information about uh, some innovations, uh, what we are doing and which uh, vehicles we are utilizing from. So last two years, uh, Turkey, uh, Turkey is producing. <laughs> yeah. Come on. You see, yeah. you see, <laughs> yeah, you can. right. <laughs> if I did your colleague smart. is here, not colleague. Uh, he's my general director. That's why I'm second time. 
<laughs> even worse. <laughs> even worse. You guys catch me now? Yes. Yes. So uh, last uh, last two years, we are, we are uh, producing uh, unmanned uh, air vehicles. So we are started to use these unmanned uh, air vehicles, UAVs, uh, for the forest fires as well. It's important, really. After uh, sorry, post fire, to uh, you should uh, intervene the forest fires. As much as this, uh, you should, uh, how can I say, have the uh, early warning system as well. Uh, with these uh, unmanned air vehicles, uh, we can uh, easily detect it, even it is not uh, fired more. Even the, from the smoke, we can detect it, and we, uh, is our uh, record, I think, in 12 minutes, uh, we have mm. a chance to uh, intervene for fires in Turkey, and it's uh, our record, and we are always uh, expressing this information everywhere. Yeah. So uh, the another point is we are um, mostly in sensitive part of Turkey. We are uh, built a, a pools for only forest fires. Uh, like in Turkey, in total, we have 4,500 forest fire pools in the forest areas. Uh, and uh, it's really advantage for helicopters and the ground uh, power to take the water uh, through the uh, take to the uh, forest fire place. Mm -hmm. So uh, at this at this point, uh, we are thinking about the climate change and uh, carbon emissions with the forest fires. We should think about the fuel, uh, fossil fuels. For, sorry, fuel, fossil fuels. Yeah. Their, uh, the helicopters and another vehicles are consuming. That's why uh, it's a really good project for our country, and we are trying to uh, make them uh, like uh, increase their number in our country as well. So, yeah. And then you're going to tell us how you, the Global Fire Management Platform can support that very detailed work. Yeah, that's, uh, that's really an uh, important point for me. And like uh, whenever, uh, as soon as I heard about this platform, I felt like this, uh, like uh, the world is our home and uh, we are the human in living in the home. Mm -hmm. Like if uh, in the, the fire is in the kitchen, if you are sitting in the sitting room and you, you cannot say, I don't care, the kitchen is uh, firing. So uh, this platform is telling us this is a really global uh, responsibility and we have to, uh, how can I say, we have to do something uh, for, the, like, for the, our home and our world as well. And uh, we can share our experiences through this uh, platform. And the another point, and I saw uh, the word, is like a knowledge hub. Yeah. yeah, we can come together here and we can uh, experience, share our experiences in this hub. Uh, so, and we can come, uh, intervene and we can uh, come up with new technologies and we have a chance to keep up with the new technologies. I would like to also finalize my uh, sentences. In Turkey, we have a, a training center in Antalya also, and we are hosting the uh, people and experts from the other countries as well, up to, 80, up to 60 people can come to our country and then we can host them. So we have a system to simulate uh, si for a simulation for the uh, forest fires and then they can easily to see what we are doing and what they can do with this uh, simulations. And thank you so much. Thank you very much. Very good indeed. Mr. Ur Karakoc from the uh, Ministry of Agriculture and Forestry in Turkey. Thank you very much indeed. Now let's move to another country which has a um, good reason uh, for being on top of this. And we're talking about Indonesia, which has huge forest areas. And we have Dr. Raflis B. Panyentan, who is the expert staff of the minister in the Ministry of Environment and Forestry, the Landscape Fire Ministry, actually. So please uh, talk to us about innovation in integrated fire management in your region and how this platform can support your work, please. Need a microphone? Yes. Over to you, sir. Yes. You're okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Uh, moderator is very active and energetic. <laughs> I'm to be glad here. Uh, you give a chance for me, for Indonesia especially, to explain or to describe what Indonesian I've been done for forest fire management. First of all, I would like to inform that Indonesia, since uh, 1984, so many uh, cooperation with the NGO, especially from 
of forest fire <coughs> management. But at the time, until 2015, his uh, activity is uh, business as usual. Try to suppress the fire. But since 2015, when the big fire, I think all of the world is known, 2.6 million hectares was burned in all over Indonesia. <coughs> and at the time, President Jokowi made a new decision, new paradigms. So he stopped suppression activity and changed to prevention. And what we are doing with the prevention, the first, all the planning, you should go to prevention. The activity, early warning system, involving local people, the tech of the fire in the villages, because mostly, I think, over the world, this fire is comes from the ground. It's not from the uh, air, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> and then uh, we, 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 we calculate, we measure all the villages, and then we make action to make petrol by involving all local people and villages and stakeholders, all the private sector. So it's come all the integrated. And then also we make uh, suppression by if the fire big, by using the air suppression and also uh, uh, water bombing. And the, and the second, uh, Indonesian, by decided by Ministry of Environment, decided that law enforcement to all the company, yeah, if they haven't have uh, any brigade to uh, control to manage their area and give a high sanction or uh, uh, penalty to the company if they not prepare all uh, equipment and then uh, activity, and the third. Uh, Indonesian uh, makes one of the solution permanent by using uh, technology weather modification. The last two years, I think we have done, uh, and by uh, measure from the satellite, the, the number or the percentage of the uh, moisture or water to the ground is very high, and it is uh, to help the pitland area, that because the pitland area is, is a very uh, prone, if they are dry and easy to burn. However, even if uh, the, uh, the pitland is dry, if there is no one to put the fire, I think in Indonesia is impossible because by research, I think 99% is fire in Indonesia by human being, by mm -hmm. actor. Yeah. Yeah. So that's why. When we set up the new system, we told the president, to ministry, we should touch the local people in the ground. What we are doing to make, uh, to involve them to all activity, uh, give them a new uh, livelihood, because most of them, they clean their area by fire because to plan something mm -hmm. to fulfill their livelihood. Now, so this now government, now is change and then give some uh, area of forest for them planting and then they can harvest the uh, the non-timber product not it, it sounds as though you have hmm. really been getting on top of this in yes. indonesia which is excellent can you briefly now hmm. uh, talk about the platform and how it could support your already excellent efforts okay yeah now we have already some uh, uh, system in indonesia we call it Sipongi, so we can detect all the hotspot all over Indonesia, and then we can uh, go through the uh, ground to check, and if fire, they stop it, uh, they suppress, and uh, if you have the program, uh, at least we can make it, we can uh, collaborate it. Uh? Yeah. We have already done, we can collaborate it. How it can be done in Indonesia? Because Indonesia is specific. You cannot uh, generally put the, your integrated program, your program in Kalimantan, mm -hmm. same as Sumatra, same as Java. No, because it's local people, it's different. And the, the, the specific, the species of the soil is different. And the content, yeah? and the local, and the government is just something, uh, it's difficult. So we should go little by little and to touch them how important this forest fire should be stopped by giving them 
not to uh, to to stop but to give some uh, uh, some way out for the local people An example for increase the diversification of product for local people inside very good inside this forest thank, thank you. you very thank much you. thank you very much too dr raffles b panyaitan from the ministry the landscape fire ministry of environment and forestry we've got a couple more uh, speakers one of two of whom are online and of course one here in uh, the red room mr martin monaco who is director of forest ministry of environment and sustainable development uh, martin mata you're going to speak in spanish and we have also uh, lucas uh, titon is it titon um who um, is, who is going to be replacing Carlos Carlos Lopez Lopez but we're not going to you yet so please don't put the don't do the link yet otherwise it's going to keep delaying uh, but you we're going to go to now I believe you, you're going to speak in Spanish as well I think so because there is no interpretation for us up here there are no headsets I'm going to put you at the two of you uh, one after the other in a moment because I want to go down and put the headset on so I can hear what you're saying not yet so we're going to go to Madame Lucy Amisa now research scientist at the Forestry Research Institute of Ghana and you're part of the regional sub-Sahara wildfire network we're going to go to you and then we'll hear from Mr. Martin Monaco and Mr. Lucas Titon so we can all both hear both in Spanish, I believe. Yes. So, uh, Lucy Amisa, over to you. Very much for this opportunity, and I would like to thank FAO for inviting me mm -hmm. to participate in this panel discussion. And in Ghana, fire continues to be a problem. The high forest zone of Ghana, which is tropical moist forest, over thirty percent of the area experiences now fires. And in the savannah, we have almost 90% of the area experiencing annual fires. And of course, the savannah fire is an integral part of that ecosystem. In the forest zone, until 1983, we're not having much fires in that zone. The few fires that occurred occurred in the dry semi deciduous um, part of the, of the zone. And so from 1983 up to now, Ghana has been putting in measures to ensure that we are able to manage these fires. We have a PNDC law 229 that gives direction as to how fires should be managed and which institutions are supposed to be involved. In the past, the issue of fire use was seen as a bad thing by the uh, regulation. But in 2006, the country formulated a new wildfire um, policy and the policy recognized the useful use of fire in livelihood activities. And so um, a lot of guidelines have been developed to help farmers to use fires uh, responsibly in their day-to-day -day activities. In the forestry sector, the Forestry Commission now uses a manual of operation for manual of procedures for fire management in the forest zone. So the point is to be able to integrate fire management into their day-to-day -day operations. Largely, I would say the fire management in Ghana is really community-based and the knowledge of local communities are taken very seriously. And so far, we've been able to integrate their knowledge into um, fire management. We did a survey that looked at um, the role of fire in farming systems, and we noticed that fire with that Farming without fire will be impractical for a lot of farmers in the country because they use fire as a means to reduce um, labor. So the management of fire in Ghana focuses very much on prevention and prey suppression activities. And this is because most often when the fires get large, it is very difficult to, to suppress them. The Ghana National Fire Service have a division that um, foresees management of fires within forest. But because of the original focus of the department, which is basically structural fires, sometimes it's very difficult for them to be able to help suppress fires occurring in the natural landscape. And so community fire volunteers have been used to 
ensure that fires that are small occurring within the local communities are, are suppressed. And so focus is very much on training these fire volunteers. And a lot of volunteer groups have been established within the communities to, to help. Now, looking at our relationship with um, people in the sub-region, um, for the past 10 years, we, we joined the Global Fire Monitoring Network. And so I have been leading the Western African Network. And we are working together with the Global Fire Monitoring Network to be able to um, share information across the countries in West Africa. Because we noticed that whereas other countries seem to be moving, advancing forward with fire management, others are lacking behind. And so the platform offers an opportunity for us to be able to share knowledge and conduct training together. Recently, we established the West African Regional Fire Management Resource Center. And the idea of the resource center is to be able to generate, archive and interpret um, and then disseminate scientific technical knowledge on um, landscape fires. We also want to use the um, center to support and advance landscape fire management training courses and then combine field practices for professionals working in the institutions with a task to landscape fire management. And we also want to conduct and facilitate consultation on cross-border cooperation in fire management, including cross-border exercises. And the idea is also to be able to develop a geoportal for forecasting of fires across the region. And one of the key problems in Ghana is that we a lot of restoration projects are taking place, but um, people are not conducting fire risk assessment prior to um, planting. And so when planting are done and the whole area gets spent, we think that when fire risk assessments are done or fire risk maps are provided for these areas, it will help uh, restoration practitioners to do the proper planning. We also lack information for um, predicting fire behaviors in these areas. And so I think that the new platform that FAO is um, launching would be a good avenue for us to receive or share information concerning fire and weather data, fire occurrence information, so that we'll be able to model um, the fire occurrences in the uh, locality. We think that- Very much indeed. Very much indeed. Uh, uh, Lucy or Mr. as a Ghana, and you know the expression, I have had to let you land, and you have now landed. So thank you very much indeed for giving us the, as you're smiling, because you know the expression very well. You, you've now landed. I cannot let you take off again. So thank you very much indeed for giving us the excellent perspective of Ghana and explaining how you can work with this new integrated platform. That's excellent news. Now, our next two speakers, so... Um, from uh, Argentina and then also from Brazil. Uh, one is going to speak in Spanish and one is going to speak in Portuguese, I believe. So, and because I don't think we have interpretation up here, but we do need to hear what they said. So I'm going to ask you to make your remarks from the podium here. And I'm going to, do you speak Spanish? Spanish? Well, I don't, so I'm going to go down there. Okay. So I'm going to ask you to make your remarks. Do you speak Spanish? Well, you want to hear what he has to say. So we're going to have to go down and listen. There's no headsets up there. Yeah. So let's welcome our next speaker, Mr. Martin Monaco. Director of Forests, Ministry of Environment and Sustainable Development from Argentina. Please, sir, you now have the whole stage. <laughs> bueno, muchas gracias. Eh, lamentablemente no pude comprender las otras ponencias de, de, de mi panel, pero sí eh, pude escuchar la, el panel anterior. Eh, y la verdad es que es un gusto coincidir en 
en conceptos, en ideas, entender que el involucramiento de las comunidades locales, el aprendizaje mutuo de experiencias y herramientas que, que como bien se dijo anteriormente, se fueron creando para solucionar algunos problemas y que eso eh, pueda ser una herramienta para otros países, tanto como para aprender como para compartir experiencias y también tecnología, una, herramientas cada vez más importantes en, en el combate y sobre todo en la prevención y el combate de, de incendios forestales. Argentina cuenta como hace ya más de 25 años con un sistema de manejo del fuego, un sistema nacional de manejo del fuego, que está integrado por distintas instituciones, tanto los ministerios nacionales como de defensa, seguridad, el ejército argentino, eh, parques nacionales, la Administración Nacional de Parques Nacionales este, y el Ministerio de Ambiente, y también por todas las jurisdicciones provinciales eh, que hacen eh, dentro del sistema, un, un, tienen un esquema de articulación que permite, eh, sobre todo, articular y cooperar tanto eh, principalmente en el combate de incendios, donde eh, Argentina tiene una enorme superficie, es diversa y, y además tiene un montón de particularidades que tienen que ver con la diversidad de ecosistemas forestales con los que cuenta Argentina y eso requiere muchas particularidades y la cooperación entre las partes siempre hace que el tratamiento en particular de los, en el combate sea mucho más eficiente, más efectivo eh, y sobre todo cuando toman dimensiones eh, importantes como en, lamentablemente en Argentina ha ocurrido en los últimos tres años donde hemos tenido particularidades de, de una sequía que ya tiene más de tres años, una bajada histórica del río Paraná que, que ha predispuesto un montón de material combustible que antes no existía y un montón de otras circunstancias que han ocurrido en los últimos años en que donde eh, los incendios forestales han sido muy importantes y los incendios rurales también de pastizales y otros ecosistemas. Eso ha agravado por una situación que creo que también se comentó algo, que, que está vinculado a prácticas productivas, a eh, costumbres, tradiciones. En Argentina más del 90% de los incendios son de origen antrópico, eh, tienen una vinculación directa con acciones humanas en, en, su en un 90%. Y eso también, hoy se dijo en el panel anterior, tener una idea clara de las causas es para el sistema argentino una herramienta fundamental para diseñar estrategias para poder empezar a, a combatir desde la prevención, desde el manejo, desde eh, una tarea que hay que, desde, desde la educación, desde la concientización de la sociedad civil, empezar a disminuir el riesgo de los incendios eh, en el país. Particularmente eh, desde desde el Ministerio de Ambiente y particularmente con los bosques nativos, eh, Argentina cuenta con una ley de bosques que trabaja en todo el país y, y en particular también con el pago por resultados que hemos obtenido en el año 2020 del Fondo Verde del Clima que ejecutamos con, con la FAO. Eh, tenemos un, un componente dedicado a eh, el tema de incendios forestales con una mirada que también coincide con muchas cosas que se plantearon en el panel anterior, y básicamente está enfocado en avanzar, en fortalecer los esquemas de silvicultura preventiva. Nosotros entendemos que el manejo de combustible es, junto con la prevención, con la concientización, con el trabajo de difusión y de capacitación, tanto de productores eh, como de brigadistas y y sobre todo en el marco de una, de una política de educación ambiental general, además la silvicultura, el manejo de, de los ecosistemas, es una herramienta sobre la cual tenemos que avanzar. Yo recién decía eh, que estamos en una situación de una sequía importante en Argentina desde hace más de tres años, y eso cambia la dinámica del ecosistema, predispone... Eh, los, el combustible, el material combustible de otra manera a la cual nosotros no, estaríamos, no estamos acostumbrados a manejar y eso también requiere de un estudio que nos permita poder evaluar esas condiciones, poder hacer un seguimiento de esas condiciones, pero actuar en consecuencia, sobre todo con una mirada preventiva. Tenemos claro que un bosque 
nativo manejado hace que la ocurrencia de los incendios disminuya y no menos importante hace que la magnitud de los incendios que ocurran, porque sabemos que van a seguir ocurriendo, sea mucho menor, sea más manejable, sea eh, nos permita de alguna manera evitar algunos desastres, podría decir yo, que, que hemos tenido en Argentina y que hemos visto también en otros lados del mundo. El financiamiento que hemos obtenido a través del pago por resultados nos va a permitir avanzar y profundizar en esa línea que, como bien decía y que creo que, que lo vimos reflejado también eh, en, en esos conceptos que se volcaron a la hora de presentar la plataforma, eh, está, como decía, enfocado en el manejo. Y sobre todo con las particularidades que tiene cada región, también se dijo acá, Argentina, como vuelvo a decir, es muy diversa, y requiere de una mirada muy local que se enfoque en, eh, en, en las particularidades que sean, en definitiva, para cumplir el objetivo, herramientas eficientes. Además, el sistema, como decía, cuenta con un sistema de, de monitoreo, de alerta temprana, eso está desarrollado en Argentina, pero muy probablemente, y ya me anticipo a tu pregunta, muy probablemente compartir las experiencias eh, en cuanto a ser más eficiente el monitoreo. Hoy hay un desarrollo de herramientas digitales, eh, un montón de herramientas que seguramente harán más eficiente el control, el monitoreo eh, para la prevención, pero también eh, para el combate. Seguramente poder compartir las experiencias y las herramientas va a ser eh, que, que tengamos un mejor sistema y, un, y mejores resultados. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much. I'm glad I came down so I could hear what you had to say. Wonderful. Okay. Yes. I hope you understood everything that we were saying <laughs> because there was no interpretation for us up here. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Okay, so penultimately, yes, and we could resume our seats. And before we hear from Mr. Uh, Petri Warinen, uh, who is a senior forest and land use specialist at Green Climate Fund, and we're building up to um, the launch of a publication, The Key Role of Forest and Landscape Restoration in Climate Action, which will be given by Lucy Garrett, finance specialist for forest and landscape restoration, forestry division at FAO, and Lucy's just sitting there. So that's how, how we're going to close off uh, this particular session. Let's go over to uh, Mr. Lucas Titon Andrade, who is the National Security, as the National Secretary, should I say, of the National Confederation of Family Farmers and Rural Family Entrepreneurs, CONAFER, who is going to give his perspective. Over to you, Senor. Hello, good morning. Well, uh, here in Brazil, it's still good morning. Um, I will speak in English. My name is Lucas Chiton, and I'm the National Secretary of Communications for CONAFER which is the National Confederation of Family Farmers and Rural Family Entrepreneurs in Brazil, which today is one of the largest representatives of a sector with more than 10 million people. Today, I'm here representing the president of the Confederation, Carlos Lopez, who is also an indigenous leader. Unfortunately, he was unable to participate today. Uh, well, in addition to working for Brazilian uh, family farming, We also carry out work to preserve the environment, valuing indigenous people, their culture, and their preservation practices. One of our great highlights in the work to prevent fires in all of our six biomes, mainly in the Amazon, which has been suffering from gigantic deforestation uh, through criminal fires by illegal loggers and prospectors. Indigenous communities have been managing fires in savannas and forests for thousands of, of years. Uh, this management was suppressed by governmental environment agencies following the trend of implementing ineffective zero fire policies in protected areas. Uh, the disastrous consequences of these policies led CONAFER to implement prevention work on its own with the indigenous people especially the integrated management of fire uh, through prescribed burning. This process begins with the survey of traditional knowledge and then the zoning of the territory. 
planning, executioning, monitoring, and evaluation of results, integrating traditional knowledge and technology platforms. Uh, our biggest success history is in the Xingu National Park, uh, which today is home to 17 indigenous nations and is one of the most vulnerable places to forest fires. We worked on training and preparing uh, Xingu indigenous people to fight fires locally, which drastically reduced them. On the platform presented, whenever we take new technologies into community actions, we have to evaluate the possibility of integrating everyone in the process, especially those in the affected territories, through a training process mainly. Uh, the Confederation welcomes this innovation that will bring it to our traditional and original base, a revolution in the way we manage the territory and preserve fires. So uh, it's a, just a brief comment here because actually our president uh, couldn't be here today. So I'm just here to make uh, a general pa panorama of uh, how the, the work is going here in Brazil. Uh, Mostly we do this work with the indigenous people, valuing their traditions of fire preventing, of how to manage fire, and also uh, including technology in, in this process, uh, uniting the be better things of both worlds. So I uh, congratulate FAO and COFO26 for their work. And I thank you all for the attention. Conafer here in Brazil is available to discuss and plan joint actions. Uh, we hope that you, you guys will talk to us and together we can work together to uh, manage the, the fires, especially in the rainforest. And, and after all, I, I thank you very much for, for this opportunity to explain a little bit of our work and let's keep this panel going. Thank you so much. Oh, we don't get the echo. Get there, the we echo. Go. there we go. There you go. There you go. There you go. <laughs> hopefully. 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 All our, yes, it's gone. All our country perspectives, which is excellent. So we now know everybody is doing tremendous innovative things in their own region and specifically in their own country and feeding into the platform, hopefully successfully moving beyond boundaries, which is what everybody has been saying from the Turkey, from the <laughs> Argentinian perspective, you know, from the Indonesian's perspective, the Ghanaian perspective, the Korean perspective, the Brazilian perspective. This is excellent news. So what is the perspective of the Green Climate Fund? How are they going to feed into this? Well, we have with us a senior forest and land use specialist, Mr. Petri Vorenen, who can give us a sense of how useful this is going to be for you and how you're going to connect with it. You want a microphone? That would help. Yeah, this, this might be useful. Yes. <laughs> um, so thank you very much for the invitation and the possibility to actually be here and speak to you and give a little bit of our points of view when mm -hmm. it comes to fire management, integrated fire management approaches. So for those who don't know about Green Climate Fund, we are a relatively small and relatively new organization based in South Korea. So basically have been operational just for five, six years. But we are the biggest fund in the world when it comes to climate change action. Mm -hmm. So we have a portfolio of roughly $46 billion as approved projects around the world. And on the forestry sector, it's still a bit uh, small, but we are working on it. So it's uh, roughly $3 billion US dollars. And when it comes to fire management, unfortunately, we don't have a single project on fire management yet. But this is something what we are going to change. Um, 
Uh, but on the other hand, we have in some of my projects, or many of our projects in the forest sector, we have fire management components. So we are supporting countries in establishing early warning systems, uh, development and implementation of fire management plans, establishing community fire brigades, awareness raising, capacity building, etc. But it's clear that we need and we have to up the game a little bit. And uh, so the good news is that during the coming replenishment of GCF, which means the next coming four or five years, forest fires are going to be one of the priority areas in the forestry sector in our books. Um, so that's what it means, that we need some good project ideas from our partners and from the countries. And integrated fire management is actually ticking many of the boxes, good boxes in our books. When we are talking about what is a good project, it is um, uh, contributing to both adaptation and mitigation goals. It is cross-sectoral, forestry, agriculture, livelihoods, health. Um, <clears throat> we are involving the local people using the trad traditional knowledge, enhancing collaboration inside the countries, horizontally, vertically, and across the borders, what was mentioned here, between the countries. So it's ticking many boxes, and also it has very clear linkages to two other important up-and-coming themes as GCF, which is working with uh, indigenous people, local communities, using the traditional knowledge, and health. And health, we are talking about now, haze and smoke pollution, and the health impacts of those. These are things which are coming up, and integrated fire management is basically linking these three themes very nicely. So, summarizing my intervention, we want to fund fire management-related projects, and we need project ideas. And now I emphasize the ideas. We don't need to have concept notes of these 50-page complex documents yet. <laughs> We need, I need just two pages, because we are very keen on working with you, the countries and the partners, developing these ideas, the concept notes, and further the funding proposals. And we have even funds available for this. It's the readiness funds, $1 million per year per country, just to do gap analysis, feasibility studies, and develop concept notes. Further, to develop funding proposals, up to $1.5 million to develop a funding proposal. There is money available. Just contact us, reach us out, and let's work together. There is money available. Just come and ask nicely. <laughs> Petri, thank you very much indeed. That's a wonderful, very, usually when people come to these events, it's to ask for money. Here's somebody who wants to give money, but to not just concept notes, to genuine ideas and projects there is money to work with countries to develop these ideas and turn them into something real. The money is there, the projects are not yet there. They're not meeting you yet, but they will hopefully come. <laughs> but let, let's give our round of applause and thanks to all our speakers. So, to Petri Fuonanin, Lucas Tetron, Andrade, Madam Lucy Amisa, Mr. Martin uh, Monaco was also with us. Um, ah, Mr. Ur Karakoch from Turkey, <laughs> Dr. Raf Lesbi Panyatan, thank you very much, and also Ms. Gina Kim, thank you very much indeed, thank you very much indeed. We're now going to transition to the final part of our session, thank you very much. And as we are making our transition, let me remind you of this, because the next International Wildland Fire Conference is happening in Portugal next year. Have a quick look at this slide and a short video, a path to recovery and well-being, forest restoration, just to set us up for the launch of the role of forest and landscape restoration in climate action. So you've got the slide there. Can we just play the short video, please? When we take steps to restore a forest, we play a part in something much bigger. We're making a better world for our health and for the health of future generations. 
By replanting and managing our forests sustainably, we create new spaces where plants and animals can thrive. We promote economic activity that brings work and improves lives. We make a real impact on climate change. We improve the quality of the air we breathe, the food we eat, and water we drink. We create a healthy environment for our children to grow. It's never too late to take action. Let's restore our forests and create a better future. There we go. Wonderful. Great stuff. So working together to manage fires for climates and people. And remember, the next International Wildland Fire Conference is in Portugal next year. Now, let me invite uh, Lucy Garrett, Finance Specialist for Forest Health, another money person for forest and landscape restoration at the Forestry Division of FAO. And so, Lucy, you're going to launch this publication, The Key Role of Forest and Landscape Restoration in Climate Action. Over to you. Thank you very much, Henry. Um, uh, very happy to launch uh, this publication today. It's been a collaborative publication across FAO. Um, forest and landscape restoration is a relatively recent resp response to the impacts of forest and landscape degradation, but it aims to recover ecological functionality and enhance human well-being, uh, and is also a vital response to climate change impacts. So feeds very well following on from uh, these discussions from earlier on. There's an urgent need to protect and build carbon sinks through halting deforestation and restoring forests. So in addition, the social and ecological resilience of landscapes need to be strengthened. So forest and landscape restoration, FLR, is one natural climate pathway. And forest and landscape uh, restored ecosystems, forest ecosystems, have the potential to remove and store approximately 12 billion tonnes of carbon. So it provides a huge opportunity to better indicate, integrate tangible restoration aligned targets and provides an alternative to business as usual with more sustainable land management practices. So the climate change agenda has also recognized the importance of FLR in both mitigation and adaptation outcomes. Uh, with the UNFCCC COP26 Glasgow Leaders uh, Declaration on Forest and Land Use, also the COP26 Global Finance uh, Forest Finance Pledge, the sixth IPCC report, and also the UN Decade um, on uh, UN Decade on Ecosystem Restoration, uh, and is developing various initiatives. So, given this timing, um, this policy paper uh, has aimed to illustrate the actual and potential role of FLR in climate action, but it's also examined strategies to integrate FLR into climate change initiatives and to propose um, recommendations to greater enable climate change um, synergies between FLR and climate change programs. So the paper has highlighted that there are diverse impacts from different FLR interventions um, that can have uh, diverse outcomes for mitigation and adaptation. It emphasised a key role that FLR can play to avoid carbon emissions and protect existing carbon sinks but also to build those sinks and enrich biodiversity on the ground. It can also reduce emissions through improved sustainable land management practices. And then another key role of FLR has been to identify its ability to improve and build both environmental and social resilience through things like improved soil fertility, local climate cooling, and engagement with indigenous peoples and local community and um, sustainable value chain development. Um, there were multiple and diverse mechanisms that we identified in the paper to how to integrate FLR process into climate change outcomes. So these included identifying priorities and indicators to restore carbon-rich ecosystems, such as peatlands, mainstreaming FLR into uh, nat nationally determined um, NDCs to uh, integrate FLR aligned targets, and this would be to increase and foster synergies and improve coordination across intersectoral plans and policies, which I think, you know, in integrated uh, fire management was also one of the um, key elements from the discussions earlier. It also identified key elements of climate risk screening and risk management through uh, GEF projects to address climate specific risks uh, in the development of restoration design and implementation on the ground. Uh, also realizing adaptation benefits through restoration projects funded by climate funds, such as the Adaptation Fund, 
and GCF, and also identified how important it was to secure land tenure uh, and enable engagement with and participation of indigenous people and local communities. Um, it also illustrated how FLR can support the delivery of multiple co-benefits to meet aligned targets with the SDG agenda uh, to um, simultaneously enhance adaptive capacity on the ground and resilience of people and ecosystems to not only deliver climate change adaptation but also mitigation as well. So key messages uh, that came out of the paper that both climate change and restoration are inextricably linked um, together and, um, and that climate change uh, is accelerating the degradation of forests and landscapes but is also a huge and can also be a huge source of emissions. So restored landscapes will therefore have a huge role in increasing the impacts, uh, resilience uh, to the impacts of climate change. It also identified these multiple synergies and opportunities to align both restoration objectives and climate change commitments to enhance actions on the ground and to meet these pledges and uh, global goals. This included better integration within um, climate finance opportunity um, with transparent and accessible climate, climate finance um, opportunities, greater investment and um, support to integrate uh, more restoration aligned targets within NDCs and also improved engagement with indigenous people and local communities throughout the um, FLR process. Um, it emphasized the importance of monitoring, reporting and verification and the use of diverse tools, a lot of tools that we have within here in FAO, to identify priority restoration biomes, but also to, um, to, to monitor impact and, and change adaptation processes. And it has the potential to contribute to wider um, global goals. So this paper, um, we're launching it today, unfortunately, due to uh, a few uh, issues out of our hand. The paper's not available today, but should be available either next week or the following week. So we invite you to either um, keep an eye on the uh, Forest and Landscape Restoration page to uh, see when it will be launched, or please get in contact with me, and I'd be happy to send you a copy. So thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And Henry's already run to the plenary for the, the high level panel that will be starting in a minute. Thanks, big thanks to those of you who stuck to the end. Please read the paper, it's fantastic. And we look forward to working with all of you on integrated fire management, including the recovery restoration phase. Thank you.